Thank you for coming. Um, this uh, is the first of a three-week series to end uh, 2022. So I thought I'd start off with a, a story that uh, will probably, for most of you, be unforgettable. This happened in a church somewhere, uh, maybe in Dallas, I'm not sure, but listen up. So the pastor asked if anyone in the congregation would like to express praise for an answered prayer. Susie stood up and walked to the podium. She said, I have a praise. That means she's thankful. Uh, two months ago, my husband Frank had a terrible bicycle accident, and his scrotum was completely crushed. You ever had that happen to you? You wouldn't be laughing. The pain was excruciating. The, doctor, uh, the doctors didn't know if they could help him or not. You could hear a muffled gasp from the men in the congregation as they imagined the pain that poor Frank must have experienced. Frank was unable to hold on uh, to the children or hold me. She went on, and every move caused him terrible pain. We prayed as the doctors performed a delicate operation. And it turned out that they were able to piece together the crushed remnants of Frank's scrotum and wrap wire around it and to hold it in place with metal staples. Again, the men in the congregation cringed and squirmed <laughs> uncomfortably as they imagined the horrible surgery performed on Frank. Now, she announced in a quivering voice, thank the Lord Frank is out of the hospital and the doctors say that with time his scrotum should recover completely. All the men sighed with a unified relief. The pastor rose, tentatively asked if anybody else had anything to say. Man stood up, walked slowly to the podium. He said, I'm Frank. <laughs> the entire congregation held his breath. He said, I just want to tell my wife that the word is sternum. I've been waiting for three years to tell that one. <laughs> oh, Lord, help us today to get what you want us to get. In Jesus' name, amen. So uh, Alex de Tocqueville, a number of years ago, the uh, great um, French philosopher and statesman said this. He said, um, and these are very insightful statements, America is great because America is good, and if she ceases to be good, she'll cease to be great. Then a commentary to that was, right now America is ceasing to be good in many respects. There's a breakdown in the greatness of our country because of an erosion of moral values and ignorance of the underlying principles that built our culture. Society reflects the health of major institutions, which reflect the health of our families, which reflect the health of our individuals. All groups of society, from government to the family, are influenced ultimately by leadership. Whether it's leadership in a home, leadership in a family, leadership in a corporation, leadership in things that we volunteer for, leadership. And then finally, great cultures fall apart when great prosperity fools the people into apathy. So uh, we're going to do a little review of what we talked about the last uh, message we had before we took a break, but uh, I'm thinking about, um, oh, Humpty Dumpty. You remember how it goes? Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses, all the king's men couldn't put Humpty together again, and somebody wrote on a subway wall in New York City, Humpty was pushed. <laughs> well, it, it ain't maybe as funny as it used to be because that's happening. Uh, the world literally is upside down. And I love the passage of Scripture that's in uh, Acts chapter 17. And this is, this is uh, spoken or written in the Scripture because it's a commentary of what was going on as a result of Jesus coming, living, and, and dying, and being raised from the dead, and invading the lives of many people. These people saw him, were changed by him forever. 
And so it says in that great passage in Acts uh, 17, 6, but when they did not find them, they were looking for these Christians, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers to the rulers of the city, crying out, these who have turned the world upside down have come here too. They didn't turn the world upside down. The world was already upside down. They were turning it right side up. Same thing that needs to happen in our world, in our society today. So uh, as we begin to, to, to look at this again, a brief review of last time, and the title was uh, a, The Spiral Road. The question last time was, why is the world broken? And we said, number one answer is, because people are broken. And when the people are broken, the world's going to be broken because the world is people. So we're literally, and we said this again last time, that our country and the world is under judgment. That's what this book says. If you go all the way back, and I'm not going to repeat this today, but if you just go back and read in the first book of the Bible, the third chapter, Genesis 3, when the first people that God made decided they wanted to give God the finger and do what they wanted to do and break the rule that he had put together in front of them. And he said, there are going to be consequences if you break it. And you'll read there very clearly the consequences that came out as a result of these people disobeying a holy God. Some people say, I was talking to somebody the other day and in another city, and they were talking about a friend in their family, and they were saying that the friend who was kind of having a hard time in life said, you know, looking to my friend talking on the phone, said, you're just too judgmental. Well, let me tell you, we can be too judgmental, but God's never too judgmental. When we have a problem with God being judgmental, it's because we don't understand who he is. He is the holy creator of everything. You and I wouldn't be here. We didn't create everything. He created everything. He created you and me. You take him out of the equation, we've got zero. We have no existence. And so, therefore, we need to understand we're under judgment. But if you go to Romans 1, and I will read this again, Romans 1, 8 uh, through 23, we're going to have a lot of Scripture today. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. And we use the, uh, the idea of suppress here is like taking a coil and mashing it down, a strong coil, but you can only keep it down so long because it's eventually going to begin to pop up. And this is what it means, that you, they try to suppress the truth of God, but eventually that truth is going to win out. It's going to pop back up, and it's popping back up today in the lives of many people. So it goes on to say, uh, uh, let's see, 19, because what may be known of God is manifest with them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. In other words, creation. Even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. And what he's saying here is the person without the Bible in Bula Buddha land or anywhere is without excuse in terms of understanding there's a God. Not a God, but God. They might not be able to articulate who that God is, what that God is like, his character, etc. But there's no excuse for, for not at least realizing there's somebody behind all this. That's the case he's laying here. And so, therefore, by the things that are made, even his eternal power, Godhead, so that they're without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful. Boy, there's a big one. We'll come back to that in a couple weeks. But became futile in their thoughts. Now, futile, we defined it last time, incapable of producing any useful result. Pointless. Futile in their thinking. And then in their thoughts and in their foolish hearts, they were darkened. And when it says they're darkened, it's going back to what the heart is. In the Hebrew mind, the heart was the mind, the will, and the emotion. How a man thinks, how he acts and decides, and how he feels. And if everything's screwed up and screwed around, often what we do is we run by our feelings because we can't think straight. We don't think correctly. And so he goes on to say, 22, uh, professing uh, themselves to be wise, they became fools. And that, that basically, you can say, was stupid or wicked. 
So if you see people doing crazy, ridiculous, stupid, evil things, it's coming out of that kind of heart. And so if your heart is darkened, then it's going to, it's going to yield a fool, a person who is stupid and wicked in terms of living everyday life. It's interesting that Psalm 14.1 said, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. If you're a fool and you hear about Jesus and about God, and you just dismiss that. Well, that's Sunday school stuff. That is no reality. That is, doesn't make any difference in my life. I want to get after it and do what I want to do. To, that is a fool. If you're here today and that's what you're saying, either out loud or to yourself, you're a fool. You're not thinking straight. But there's hope for you. Hang in there. I know you had your, your Mexican food. and Hang in there. All right. So he says, the professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals. In other words, they were worshiping idols. They made these little wooden images thinking that a piece of daggone wood could protect them or give them what they wanted. That's pretty stupid. That's pretty stupid. You know what? As we said last time, we can erect these same idols today. They just may be made of something else. And so in Romans chapter 1, verse 24, you can read the following. Therefore, any time in the Bible you see the word therefore, always ask what the therefore is there for. And what it's going to go back to is the context that you've just read. And it's going to say, all right, now, therefore, as a result of Romans chapter 1, 18 through 23, here's what God did, or here's what the next action is. Therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanliness in the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves. God gave them up to it. You want that? Have at it. And he will do with that, that with us in our day and time. If we say, God, I want to get my ticket punched so I can go to heaven, but I'm going to go out and live like hell. He's going to say, is that what you want? Well, then you really don't know me. I'll give you up to all that stuff, all the appetites, all the crazy stuff. You want it? Take it. Go after it. He will give you. But then let's go on. Then you look at verse 126 in Romans. For this reason, God then gave them up to vile passions, for even their women exchanged natural use for what is against nature. Now we have the lesbian movement or the lesbian revolution. Verse 27, likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another, men with men, committing what is shameful, and receiving in themselves a penalty their error, which was due. Now we have the homosexual movement or revolution. So all this stuff, this is nothing new. This is nothing new. But what we understand a lot, don't understand a lot of times is where this emanated from, where it came from. It came from a heart that was darkened, futile thinking, a foolish heart. we got to know the background. Or we're just going to say, well, you know, that's just the way things are. That's just the way people are. That's just the way they popped out. That's their proclivity. No, it's called sin. It's going the opposite direction of the way God wants us to go. And so that's some of the things that happened as a result of God giving us up. And he still gives people up today to our, proclivity, our natural proclivities. So, um, for some reason, my paper got out of order here, and we're going to get it back real quickly. Okay, now, verse 128, and it says, And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind. Now, what is a debased mind? It is a non-functioning mind that rejects God. That's what it is. And people can't think reasonably. Another way to say it that's a little more dramatic, it means they're insane, irrational, and make ridiculous choices and decisions. That's why when you see some of the stuff going on today, you hear it on the news or whatever else, you say, oh my gosh, they used to say that 20, 30, 40 years ago, that was going to happen. It's happening. Where'd that come from? I'm telling you where it's coming from. We need to understand where these things come from. They don't happen by accident. And so therefore, it says in Romans chapter 1, verses 29 and 32, listen to this being filled with unrighteousness, 
sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They were whisperers, backbiters. Don't become a backbiter. Don't be talking about people behind their back. Have the kahunas to talk to people face to face. Don't be gossiping. That's, that's not real, God's not real big on gossips and backbiters. Haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents. Ever see much of that around? Undiscerning, unworthy. I've got a friend in another city. He hasn't seen his daughter in nine months. She's a sophomore in college. She won't talk to him. She won't talk to the mom. She won't talk to her sisters. She's got a boyfriend that she ought not to be with, and I don't know what's happened there. You ever gone through that one? And she claims to love Jesus. Well, let me tell you, sweetie, if you love Jesus, you're going to go back home. You're going to apologize because you got a father that loves you, not only here, but down here. But we see that all the time. Unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who know the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but approve of those who practice them. Oh, baby, go do all you want to do. That's cool. That ain't cool, but that's what happens when we become fools. And so Francis Schaeffer said years ago, and it's interesting to me, by the way, with all the things that I just read and all the things from Romans and all the things we see going on now, we say, oh, my gosh, can't believe it. And not only that, but we have leaders in our country that are creating laws to protect people that are insane. How stupid. How, why would you pass a law for something that's diametrically opposed to that because the, because the leader is a fool? The leader sold out. The leader may never even be aware of this. They will someday, but we need to understand that. And so, in uh, Francis Schaeffer, years ago, a man I studied in Switzerland, and I say this quote all the time, in the 70s, he said, at, and he was from America, at the turn of the century in the United States of America, the number one issue will be, is there a consensus that there's any such thing as absolute truth? He called it true truth. Well, there's not. And it's way below 50%. And even when you go to the Christian world and pastors and leaders and surveys are done by Barna and Gallup and all these other groups say, it's like 30, 35% at best that believe there's absolute truth. Well, when you don't believe there's something that's true, whether you feel like it's true or not, but it's absolutely true, then you're going to do what? Do what you write in your own, for your own benefit. You're going to make up your own rules. And that doesn't have a happy ending. Some of you are historians. Go back in history and see how that worked for some other cultures. And so the question is, here's the question for today. How then should we, in light of the environment we're living in, how should we live? Now, for you are here today seeking an answer to life, to fulfillment and purpose, hang on. For those of you who know Christ, or at least you claim to, we need to know how he wants us to live. How do we live and make a difference in this crappy place we're living in now in terms of the environment and the culture and the mores that are going on? How do we live? So that's what we're going to jump into right now. Take a couple of verses, just two verses, from a little book called Philippians. Now let me give you a little background here. It's a small town. It had a, it had a strategic location Location's everything. You guys that are builders, you know, location, location, location. It was at the crossroads in terms of the travel uh, that people had. So when you came through Philippi, whatever happened in Philippi, then would spread all over the place. That's why I've always thought about Dallas and the critical location we have here. I mean, we're right in the center of the thing. And what happens here has the potential of going all over the country and around the world. What an opportunity. Do you think about that in terms of impacting the lives of people around you? They, they went under Roman conquest in the second century. They were rich with gold mines. They were once a pretty decent city, but they turned into a bad town. Not good. So there was a lot of disunity. The people that were following Christ were getting pounded 
just like Christians are getting pounded today, whether it's in the media, one-on-one, in a conversation with someone else or whatever. But Paul, who wrote Philippians under the inspiration of God, is in prison. And in his four-chapter little book, he says this, listen, I want you to be full of joy. And his butt was in prison. How do you do that? How do you do that when you know people walking around in Dallas, friends you have in a neighborhood, whatever, whatever, and these people, there's something different about them, not weird or odd, but they, they have tragedy going on, storms going on, difficulties going on, and yet they still smile. They don't relinquish to that and give in and get depressed. They hang in. In fact, they may encourage you more than you encourage them. Oh, that's what Christ can do. That's what he can do if you know him for real. And so he said, be full of joy. Now, the culture around there, let's look at, let's look at uh, Philippians for a moment. Philippians 2, 14 through 16. Do all things without grumbling, complaining, or disputing, that you may become blameless and harmless children of God, without fault, and here we go, number one, a crooked and perverse generation. So what does it mean to live in a crooked generation? It's, this comes from scoliosis, the curvature of the spine. It's being bent or being twisted. That's the idea behind the concept here, crooked. The people had deviated from God's standard. They were going another way, following another voice, following another path. And that was what was going on here. Let me quote something. This is pointing to a natural and human depravity that that directs people uh, and twists people and makes people crooked in how they live their life. A couple of great passages in Proverbs. Proverbs 21, the way of a guilty man is perverse, but for the pure, the work is right. Isaiah 59, the way of peace they have not known, and there is no justice in their ways. They have made themselves a crooked paths. Whoever takes that way shall not know peace. You see, crooked, twisted people make and take crooked paths. They don't know anything else to do. That's all they're aware of. That's all they can do. And so as we begin to see this, but he said not only is it crooked, but it's perverse. That means to distort, bend out of shape, perverted. So crooked and perverse. You say, well, that, 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 where, where do they do that? It's all over Dallas. You want me to drive you around? It's all over Dallas. It's everywhere. And so the, in the United States today, uh, to radically distant and deviate from God's standards, you're going to get what you get. Somebody said, well, you know, we don't, we don't live near a crooked and perverse world. No, you're right. We live in it. We're right in the daggone middle of it, right here. So what are we going to do? How are we going to live? Uh, some people say, well, I want to run. I want to run. I got a place up in Montana. If you have a place in Montana, invite me sometime. I've never been to Montana. I'd like to go to your place. <laughs> But you know, there's really no place you go. You go to Mexico, ain't going down there. You going to, you going to Canada, oh, baby. Well, where are you going? Read Psalm 139 sometime. You can't run. You can't hide. <laughs> Ooh, boy. So anyway, uh, here we are in November, the 20, or November 2nd, 2022, in a country that's under judgment, in a country that's crooked and perverse. So what are we going to do? You know, when I was preparing this, I said, well, I'm sure some people are thinking, well, has God gone to sleep? Is he sleeping? Is he, has he lost control? Did he just not care anymore? Uh, why didn't he do something? Let me tell you what. The answer to that is he's done something. We see all this stuff going. Why didn't he do? He's done something. He's done something. He sent his son. That was his answer. He said, I don't like that answer. Well, then you're screwed. Ain't going to be no other answer. It's kind of like the disciples when they were with Jesus, and and he said, are you all going to run too? We've already said some people running for And they said, Peter, I think it might have been. He said, well, where are we going to go? we got no place else to go. Where are you going to go to get your life together? There's no place else to go. 
I've lived almost 79 years, and I'm telling you, there's no place else to go. So we might ought to get the wax out of our ears and take this seriously. Somebody's saying back here, John, why don't you tell another one of those funny jokes? We want to laugh. We laughed, okay? We've got to get serious for a few minutes here. And this is very important. So the people, and if you look at the verse again of Philippians 2, 14, and verse 15, it says, that you may become blameless and harmless children of God. So this passage in Philippians at the time was addressed to people that were following Jesus, children of God. Now, this is very important. You stick with me on this little segment here. Not everyone is a child of God. I've heard this soupy thinking and theology before of everybody's a child of God. No, you're not. When Genesis 3 happened and people were disconnected from God because of sin, no longer were we in his family. We re- if you are not a follower of Jesus, he doesn't live in you, you relate to God as your creator, but not as a child of God. You got to become a child of God. You say, well, how do I become a child of God? Well, it tells us in John chapter 12, excuse me, chapter uh, 1, verse 12, but as many as received him, to them he gave a right to become a son of God. That's it. That is it. So why don't people do that? Well, look at John 8. But because Jesus said, I tell the truth, you do not believe me. Let me tell you something. To not believe in Jesus is to reject him. You say, well, I'll put it off someday. Well, I'll get to that in a minute. So you say, then how is it that I can't respond to him? Some of you may be sitting here now, or maybe this happened in your life in the past, or you know somebody like this, and they've heard messages like this, a clear, hopefully, message of how you can come to know Christ and what he can do, and it's just they're blocked. They can't make the move. And why can't we make the move? It's very interesting. In Ephesians chapter 1, he was talking to people in this town called Ephesus, and a bunch of them had become followers of Jesus. But he says in Ephesians 1, or chapter 2, verse 1, and you were, past tense, dead. That means they were totally incapable of even responding to a great message. If Billy Graham came from the dead and was speaking right now, and it gave this kind of message, there'd still be some in there saying, eh. If you are dead spiritually, you cannot respond to the life and the message of Jesus. You can't do it. It's impossible. People tell me, well, one of these days I'll come to him. No, you won't. And I'll talk about that in a moment. Listen, he says you're dead. There's no capacity that we have in and of ourselves to come to know him. How, well, how do we come to know him? You know, some, one of the questions I hear a lot of people debating, why are all these um, millennials and the other groups coming along, wherever they name it, why aren't they responding to the gospel? They will respond to the gospel if they get it. We try to do all these Madison Avenue approach, approaches to try to reach people it's, listen, I sit down with guys in their 20s and their 30s, millennials and older and younger, and led them to Christ by simply telling them about Jesus in a way that it makes sense, and they say, I want that. A lot of times they don't want it because it's packaged in men and women that claim to be Christians, but they're not living it. Bad advertisement. You understand what I'm saying? There's no capacity to understand. So in John chapter number 8, listen to this. This is very indicting. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. Talking to the Jews at that time who were rejecting the Messiah. Oh, he's not the Messiah. If he's, if he's really the Messiah, then our teaching was that he's going to set up an eternal bread line and everybody's going to be fed great economic program, and he's going to defeat Roman rule, and we're going to be free. That wasn't wasn't in the script, but they thought it was. Listen to this. Uh, For I proceed forth and came from God, nor have I come of myself. But he, my father, sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Because you're not able to listen. You got wax in your ears. You are of your, oh, now there's an indictment. You say, well, I'm glad this didn't apply to me. I'm not a Christian yet, but I'm glad it doesn't. You know what he said? You are of your father, the devil. 
If you and I were not believers and followers of Jesus, we are instruments, the Scripture says, in the hands of Satan. Wow, that's pretty harsh. You may not like it, but it's in the book. And so we've got to begin to understand, which team am I going to play on? Which team am I going to become real with? And so he goes on and he says, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there's no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of lies. So how does a person come to Christ? Look at John 6, 44. That's why we encourage you, open the book. Always open the manual of operation. Don't take a verse a day, keeps the doctor away. You're going to still be limping and screwed up. you got to become, you got to let him master your life through this book. And he will do that. Look at what it says in John 6, 44. It's not on the screen. No one, Jesus said, can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. If you ain't drawn by God, you ain't going to come to Jesus. So you better be praying, you're going to be drawn. You better pray for your grandchildren, they're going to be drawn. You better be praying for your children, they're going to be drawn. So that as they're drawn, the Holy Spirit opens up their mind, and they may not understand all this stuff, but they say, I want that. I want that. I want him. And so we go on here and we see that we live now in a country that's under God's judgment, crooked and perverse, with no capability of being able on their own to believe in the God of the universe through Jesus Christ. So how do you, how do you know you're a Christian? Now, that's a good question. Because some of you are going to leave here today, you know, I thought I was in, I'm not sure if I'm in. <laughs> okay, here's the answer to that. It's not just accepting Jesus. That's, that's critical. But you might go back sometime and say, when you accepted Christ or received Christ, why did you do that? What was your motive? Was it because your wife was beating on you? Or was it because somebody made you feel guilty, but now you're over the guilt and you're back to the old patterns? What is it? Listen to this. You know you are a Christian when you desire to obey Jesus and do what he says to do. That means you're going to follow him perfectly. But there's going to be a desire in your heart and your mind. I want to know him. I want to learn to love him and to follow him. And you're going to stumble every day. But you, there is something in you that will click, God at work in you. Then you will want to begin to follow him and do what he says to do. Very important for us to understand that. Another thing we need to remember is that in this life, we're just passing through. This is not our home. If this were our final home, I'd like to have a different house. <laughs> I would. I live in a little duplex, and we're grateful for it. I'd like to have a house. <laughs> I've only had one in my whole life. I like a house. But I have to keep reminding myself I'm passing through. I'm just passing through. And another way to say that is uh, we're aliens. In 1 John 3, 1, the Scripture says, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know Him. We're just passing through. Nobody really knows and understands us that doesn't know the Lord. And so aliens, listen to this. I think this will be insightful for you if I can find my quote. Here we go. Listen to this. So we are aliens in this kind of world, a world under judgment, that on their own can't know God, with no desire to know God, no capacity to know the truth, can't understand who as Christians we are, see Christians as an impediment to, or impediment to their freedom of their, of their th transgressions and want to get Christians out of the way so nobody will question their sinfulness. That's really what's behind putting down Christianity in America. They just, they they're, they're feel guilty. They know they got crap in their life, and they don't want anybody to remind them of it. Just let, leave me alone. Whew, well, that's a little convicting. Let's keep going on. So, now in 2.15, it says, Philippians 2.15, that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. Now watch it. 
Here's, this is for believers, followers of Jesus, um, among whom you shine as lights in Dallas. You shine like lights in a dark place, in a crooked, perverse world, in a crooked, often company you work in, with a, with a demeaning boss. In all these situations where you are, where it's dark, you can shine. In fact, another translation of the word light is stars. Be a star for Christ. And so as we go through this, we see in Matthew 5, 16, Jesus said, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. He wants not glorify you or me, but glorify him. Listen, if you love Jesus and obey Jesus as best you can, you will shine like stars. It'll just happen. You don't have to say, all right, today I'm going to turn the shine on. (laughs) All you got to do is try to love him with his help and try to obey him every day, and the light will come on. He will shine through you, and it will baffle some people. Man, what's wrong with that guy? But there's going to be something very appealing and attractive about that in the life of another person. So how do I let my light shine as we close this together here? Well, how am I to live in a screwed-up world? Well, first of all, I need to understand I'm not to run from it. I tell you, there are times that I just want to go away somewhere with the stuff I have to deal with in people's lives and all the rest of it and in my own life. I just want to get away. But, you know, the Scripture calls us to live in it. That's our call. In John chapter 17, verse number 18, when Jesus prayed to his father the night before he went to the cross, he prayed this for the disciples that he had discipled then and for all in the future who would believe in him, you and me. And this is what he said. As you, Father, sent me into the world, I have also sent them where? In the monastery? No, in the world where the darkness is. Because we're the only light. He's the only light. And so how am I supposed to live in this world? Well, first of all, I think he wants us to have to, and live a life of humility. I got a good buddy. I was hoping he was going to be here today, but we're going to meet this afternoon at 3 o'clock. He's one of the top guys, and you probably won't like the name of the school, but he's one of the top guys in, uh, in um, development for the University of Florida Gators. And this guy is something else, 32 years old, just pulled in a gift recently of $150 million from somebody for the athletic department at the University of Florida. And they've got a great coach, by the way, whose number one goal is to shape these men for Christ. Shape their life. He said, we're four and four. My, 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 my goal is first, these men. Boy, if we had more coaches like that, whoo, that would be great. But Philippians chapter 2, look on the screen, 5 through 8. Let this mind be in you, Christians, that was also in Christ, who being the form of God, God in a body, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, coming in the likeness of men, being found in the appearance as a man, humbled himself, and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. That's humility. Humility doesn't mean the worm theology. I'm just a worm. Step on me and squash me. That's not what he's talking about. If you want to be a real man, a gutsy man, be humble. That's an attractive quality. Nothing wrong with being kind and nice and, and caring and, so, and humble. Jesus was like that. He's the best, he was the greatest man that ever lived. And so here, then it goes on in verse 12 of Philippians, and it says, Therefore, my beloved, or Christians, as you have also obey, always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but how, now much more in my absence. Then he makes this phrase, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. You see, I got to work to get saved? No, it's not what he's saying. He said, work at growing up so that Christ in you will begin to change you. And But here's really what it means. It means the salvation inside you needs to show up on the outside of you. Is it showing up on the outside? Is it showing up on the outside? Whew. He calls for obedience. John 14, 15, he's, Jesus said, if you love me. If you love me, then do what I say to do. 
And you won't know what to do if you don't know what he said to do in the book. You've got to be a man of the book. And so therefore, there's no growth and maturing in the faith and impact for Christ in the lives of others apart from being in the Word and obeying what it says. It ain't going to happen. So how do we live in this world? Philippians 2.14, do all things without complaining or grumbling or disputing. Let me tell you what grumbling means. It's a sense of discontent, a sense of dissatisfaction. It means a, a low, guttural muttering. Ever seen any of those guys around? Turn that air conditioner up. That food wasn't right. They didn't put me in the right seat. They don't know how much money I've, I've given to this deal. There you go. It happens every day, doesn't it? Let me tell you something. God is not big on grumblers. He is not big on grumblers. And what this is talking about, dear friends, now listen to me. We're almost done. A couple more minutes. I'm going to go five over. Listen, what this is pointing out is attitude. If your attitude sucks, your life is going to suck. Listen to this. Attitude is really about how a person is on the inside that then overflows on how we act. If you ain't acting right, something's screwed up on the inside. Now, we all have bad days, and we can love Jesus and have bad days. Uh, I love this quote by Presley, a British novelist who said in his own words, he said, I have always been a grumbler. I am designed for the part. Sagging face, weighty underlip, rumbling resonant voice, money couldn't buy a better grumbler outfit than me. Well, that's tough. That's a tough deal right there. So he says, you got to quit grumbling. In all circumstances, stop grumbling. Then he said, in disputing, he said, listen, don't create arguments or disagreements with other people that love Jesus. You know why, what the, the, one of the biggest flaws in churches are around America? Church people eat up church people. They talk about other Christians they put other believers down. Can you believe what they said? Can you believe what they did? Boom, 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 boom. We eat, we eat our own kind. We destroy them. Don't do that. That breaks God's heart. Don't dispute. Jesus can help us change and be different in how we live. So here's my question. Is your life a shining star? You say, where? With the people you know with the company you run? Is your integrity showing? How about your words out of your mouth? Are they words of life and encouragement? Or are you just setting a big cloud over everybody and everything? How about your language? How about different aspects of your life? How about that? So finally, there are three reasons why we ought to stop complaining and mumbling. Briefly, number one, for the sake of other people that follow Christ. Jesus said, I want you to become like my son, Romans 8, 29. So we don't want to impede people's growth. We want to encourage their growth. Number two, for other Christians. Listen, University of Southern California professor said, the greatest means of communication is modeling. What p words are cheap, but they need to see a changed life. They need to see your star shining. And number three, the Christians, for Christians desiring to impact others in the world. So this message today is for pastors, for elders, for deacons, Sunday school teachers, disciple makers, other followers of Christ, fathers and, and, and grandfathers and friends, etc. 216, this is the last word, 30 seconds. 216 of Philippians, Paul says, holding fast the word of life so that I, Paul, may rejoice in the day of Christ when he goes to home to be with the Lord, that I may not run in vain or have labored in vain with you knuckleheads in Philippi. You know the greatest thing you can do for me? You know the greatest thing you can do for me? Even more than writing a big fat check is to do what Jesus said to do. That's the greatest thrill of my life. Because if you're following him and doing what he says to do, you know what? This, you, you'll never be the same. Your, sa your family, your work, your friends, everything will begin to change. That's what, that's what turns me on. That's what fills my tank. That's what gets me up in the morning and wants to come here again and do this.
So Jesus, there are guys here today that need to know you. And I pray that before they leave this place, they'll either talk to me or their table leader or whatever, and they'll simply say, I want to know Jesus. But gentlemen, it's not difficult. It's just simply say to him, Lord, come into my life. Clean me up from this day forward. Help me to become the man you've always wanted me to be. And he'll come in your life, and you'll begin to see the change. And then secondly, for those of us that know you, Lord, I pray that we would yearn for and pray for and do all we need to go for every day in our lives to be that shining star. In Christ's name I pray, amen. Thanks for the extra five minutes. I appreciate it. Have a good week.